Hi there, I'm Fran Kelly, joining you from Gadigal land of the Aora Nation. I'm Carly Williams, I'm a Kondamooka woman and the ABC's National Indigenous Correspondent, also on Gadigal land in Sydney. Welcome to this special edition of The Voice Referendum Explained for podcast and TV. It's not long now until we have to vote on whether we enshrine an Indigenous voice to Parliament in the Constitution. So ahead of this important vote, we're going to go through some of the common questions that Australians are keen to work out the answers to, including the questions from you, the ABC audience. So Fran, the first question is... What are we voting on? Well, that's a good question, Carly, because that's key to it all. When you go into the ballot box to cast your vote, you'll be asked to write yes or no on the ballot paper. And this is what you'll find there. A proposed law to alter the constitution to recognise the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Do you approve this proposed alteration? So once again, you're going to be asked to vote yes or no to that. So that's what we're voting on. The whole notion, those words that you see on the ballot paper, they're not the words that are going to go into the constitution if Australia votes for this. What will go into the constitution is basically 92 words, but the first of those words are in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. So that's the big change here. Constitutional recognition of First Nations people and uh, that constitution recognition comes with the voice. And the question, what are we voting on, is a big one and it may sound silly and basic, but it's not. It's not silly because so many of us, anyone aged under 42, has never voted in a referendum. That's 6.7 million people. That's a lot of people. The AEC. Yeah, the last referendum was in 1999. So I've never voted in a referendum. So I'm trying to figure out what it's going to look like on the day. So good to clear that one up. Good totally. To clear that one up. Totally. Okay. Should we go to the next question? Yeah, I, give it to me. Where did this idea come from, Carly? Constitutional recognition for Indigenous people has been talked about for the last 100 years. There's been a lot of hard work, blood, sweat and tears and advocacy that has brought us to this point. So the coalition government set up the Referendum Council over 2016 and 2017. It was its job to figure out how to best recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia's constitution. In 2016 and 2017, we had 12 Uluru Dialogue meetings across Australia. About 100 First Nations people went to each of those meetings. So quite a lot of people around the country, Well, they Indigenous say, people. Yes, the, the Uluru Dialogue and, uh, says it's a significant consultation of First Nations people. And that all came together in 2017 at Uluru, at the Uluru Convention. Now, delegates debated and talked about this at the Uluru Convention, and then they put forward the Uluru Statement. The Uluru Statement is a sequence of reforms. Voice, treaty, truth in that order. And that is how we got to voting in a referendum if we should change our constitution to include that voice. So that's when we really first heard about the voice, wasn't it? It came out of the Uluru Statement from the heart, out of this convention. I mean, back then, not even everyone at that convention agreed, but the overall majority did. And the whole point of it was that they wanted something concrete, didn't they? Not just constitutional recognition. Not just symbolism. And you're right, not everybody at the Uluru Convention agreed. About seven people walked out. They didn't agree with the sequence of reforms. That voice should come first. Others thought that patent, like treaty or truth telling should come first. That brings me to my next question, Fran. What do Indigenous people want? Well, this is a big question because, of course, Indigenous people don't all think the same way or want the same thing. But um, what we do know about this in terms of the way we measure things, traditionally, it's through polls. We've had two polls of Indigenous Australians, uh, an Ipsos poll and a YouGov poll. They were done back in March, though, so it's a fair while ago, um, but they found 80% and 83% um, in that order of Indigenous people supporting the voice and the, um, the Uluru Statement proposal. So that's where that statement, you will have heard the Prime Minister and others say 80% of Indigenous people support it. Um, certainly it's a clear majority of Indigenous Australians who support it, but it hasn't been measured since then. I mean, Carly, you've spent the whole year as one of our Indigenous reporting team going around the country, and for this podcast we've spoken to quite a lot of Indigenous Australians. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it is clear that it is, has majority support amongst Indigenous Australians. We just can't say 
exactly what level that is. Well, that hard data comes from the polls back in March. I want to know why haven't there been more polls on mob to, to get something more recent? Well, it would be good if there had been, but those were commissioned by an uh, uh, element of the S campaign. It's very expensive to commission any polling at all, and it's particularly expensive to poll remote Australia and, and you know the in elements of Indigenous Australia that are in remote parts of the country. So they just couldn't afford it, basically. Well, we know that Indigenous Australians have a huge diversity of perspectives and views. There are lots of different mobs and nations across the country. We're not a homogenous group. And I don't think there is another group in Australia that is expected to have a collected view on a political topic. And the voice is no exception. And I think it's difficult for everyone, you know, participating in the in this referendum debate, as we all are, to you can see why people want to ask that question, because we have Indigenous Australians leading the both the yes and the no campaigns. So the high profile advocates of these two positions are Indigenous. So, you know, it's a natural thing to say, well, I don't know, what do Indigenous people want? But you're right, it's not just one thing. No. Obviously. Um, OK, we're rocketing through these questions, Carly. Why does the voice to Parliament need to be in the Constitution? Enshrined in the Constitution means it doesn't go anywhere. And Uluru Statement architects want it enshrined so it can't be dumped. Oh, there's a change of government. It won't be able to go anywhere. There have been advisory bodies in the past that like been, ATSIC and others that have been legislated and they can be shut down or dumped if something's written into the constitution you can't change it unless there's another referendum i was really struck we for our podcast which is called a voice referendum explained we interviewed rachel perkins who's a, a leading campaigner for the yes campaign she's also the daughter of charlie perkins who was a, a leading Indigenous ad activist. Um, and she made the point that in her lifetime, there have been five consultative or representative bodies created by prime ministers, created by governments, and all disbanded. Five have come and go. So you can understand, I guess, why Indigenous Australians want to say, well, enough of that. If you're going to if you're going to say you want to hear from us, if you want us to be consultative, then write it into the Constitution. But not everyone thinks that's a good idea, do they? No, but I want to know, going back to uh, these different advisory groups that have happened in the past, how different would the voice be from other government advisory bodies, Fran? Yeah, that's a question that's asked a lot. How different is this voice? It's different because it's, um, well, because it's in the Constitution, it's not an element of government. It's not an arm of government. It'll be an independent body and it's an advisory body only. So it will have no, importantly, I think, for people to understand, it won't have a budget to hand out. It's not a grants budget. That's different to ATSIC. A lot of people remember ATSIC and when and John Howard came in and disbanded it. Um, it was quite controversial, the spending of money. It won't be doing that. There are a, a set of things. We don't have gen details about how many people will be on it or where they come from because it hasn't been created yet and the parliament will have some say on both the composition functions and power of the voice ultimately. But we do have what's called eight design principles that the referendum um, group came up with. And those design principles include things like um, it will be chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people based on the wishes of local communities. It will be representative of those Aboriginal communities. It'll be gender balanced, it'll have young representatives, um, it will be community led, it will be inclusive and it will be accountable. Also it will work alongside existing organisations and traditional structures and I think that's important. It's not going to become the sole body dealing with Indigenous affairs, is it? No, and something interesting happened this week, Fran. I went to a pre-poll booth in Ultimo in Sydney and there was a no campaigner volunteer for Fair Australia there and his argument for voting no, he told us, was uh, the voice to parliament already exists in the existing agency called the NIAA. And that stands for the National Indigenous Agency, uh, Australians Agency. Now, uh, I've got an article out on this today, just breaking down the differences of what the voice would be to what the NIA is, NIAA is. The NIAA is part of government. It's not separate to government or independent like uh, the voice would be. It's in the prime minister uh, and cabinet portfolio. It can be abolished at any time. So if another government comes in, the NIAA 
could could go. And also, uh, it's about 22% of our staff at NIAA are First Nations. So another difference with the voice enshrined in the constitution, it would be all Aboriginal uh, or Torres Strait Island, and Torres Strait Islander people. So that's it. The voice, if it's if Australia votes yes, the voice will be created. It'll be elected or selected by Indigenous Australians. It will be Indigenous Australians. It will be independent and it will give advice to government and parliament. Um, so public service, government and parliament. Just advice. And as it says clearly in the words that will be written in the constitution, the government doesn't have to take that advice. Um, I think the big question, the fundamental question really is, you know, why we're doing this and, and the question you often ask is can a voice improve Indigenous lives or how can a voice improve Indigenous lives, Carly? Well the government says the voice is designed to improve Indigenous lives and close the gaps. So closing the gap targets, we are doing okay on four targets but four others are going backwards. What we're seeing worsening is early childhood development, adults in prison, children in out-of-home care and Indigenous suicide rates. We don't have a crystal ball to know if The Voice is going to magically fix those targets, especially how fast that could happen. Well, it's not, I mean, there is no magic answer. It's not going to be a silver bullet. But the whole point of it is to the argument put forward by those supporting The Voice say that A Voice will be hearing from grassroots communities, from some of them remote communities, some of them, you know, local communities in, in the cities near you, but they're coming up with ideas from the people themselves about what would work. Because as we spoke to one woman who's running a campaign in Perth, uh, in WA, um, Cheryl Kikataka, who said, you know, something has to change, something has to, and th the definite, you know, just doing what you've always done is the definition of crazy. She is supporting the voice because she says something has to change our ideas, our experience needs to be listened to. That's, that's what it's about, right? We know when mob are part of the decision-making process and making decisions for ourselves, that's where we get the most fruitful outcomes. We've seen that with youth programs. There's lots of data out there on that. This is about self-determination is mm. what the government and yes advocates say. Uh, I suppose looking forward to pass, pass this referendum, uh, will it improve Indigenous lives? What I do know is that Indigenous people right now are hurting. This has been a toxic campaign. I've had elders tell me they've been reading, you know, social media posts and then the comment section can be very toxic. So potentially there needs to be a plan to to address some of the cultural toll and the load and the impact that this has had on mob. Yeah. Um, next question. Next question. What are the main arguments from the yes side, Fran? Um, well, I guess as we were just saying, the main argument from the yes side is that this overall constitutional recognition will be a unifying moment for this country because you might be surprised to, find, to know that our constitution, so our founding document, makes no reference whatsoever to First Nations people. It was as if no one was here when the First Fleet arrived, and of course, that's not the case. Not um, true. That's not true. Um, so that's the first thing. It will be unifying to acknowledge the First Australians and, and the 65,000 years of history in the, in the founding document. Um, but the other argument is the argument that where we are living right now, as we were just saying, is not working. Things are not improving. Things are going backwards, even though we're trying so hard. So this is an argument that the Prime Minister has been putting forward this week. No is what exists right now. A vote for no is saying that what exists right now is what will continue, that we can't look for a better way. And the truth is that we have to do better. That's the key argument, really, isn't it? That what we're doing now, that, that, that voting for change, voting for this voice is really a vote of hope, really, isn't it? What about the no side? Well, the no campaign says um, that it's not unifying. In fact, their large main argument is it's divisive. But they started off very clearly with a strong argument that, and you might have seen this in the leaflets that have come into your home, that a no vote would be risky. It would be legally risky. It would be the biggest change to our constitution in all time, and it would create a risk because there'd be ongoing challenges of government. Well, yes, yeah, one of those original arguments that it would be too powerful. But uh, the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians, Jacinta Nampagipa-Price, has said that a voice would split the country. 
Now the problem with the voices, the problem with the, the, the language that is used by those pushing this is it's so divisive. It is so us and them. And that is the key argument now as we come to this end of the, of the campaign, that it's divisive. Um, it's interesting because both sides are, are claiming that their position is a unifying position. So you're going to have to make your mind up on that one, whichever way you want to vote. Um, look, we've also been getting lots of questions about polling and referendum night itself. So there's no show without punch. Who we've got here, of course, is Anthony Green, the ABC's chief elections analyst. No one better to tell us all to answer all our questions on this. Anthony, first thing, how is the voting counted? Like, what is the process? Is uh, it the same as election night? Same as election night, the count in polling places, they count in the pre-poll voting centres. Um, all the votes are counted. The only difference is it's not, doesn't have multiple candidates and preferences. It's one ballot paper, which is effectively a two horse race between candidates called yes and no. It's the same ballot paper in every polling place. So it'll be a very strict relationship between booth size and when the, re the votes are reported. So early in the night, we'll get lots of country booths. The yes vote will start low and then it will rise through the evening. The question is, at what point do you have enough votes counted that the yes vote starts to level off? And is it in favour of a yes vote or is it below the 50% threshold? Yeah. And Anthony, when will we know a decision? On the day or? We should know it on the night. You know, the only reason we wouldn't know on the result is if there's very ye narrow yes majorities and we have to wait for postal votes and postal votes will favour the no case. So I think we should know the result quick. We should know the result on the night and depending on how well, how close the result is. If it's not close, we'll know early. Well, the polls are suggesting it's not close. I mean, what are the what are you? You're expert at this. You've been reading polls for decades. Um, what do you think the polls are telling us, and how are you preparing for this broadcast? Well, the polls are telling us the referendum is going to be defeated. I mean, if you know if the polls are showing fifty, let's say the Malcolm Fraser in 1975 won an election with 56 percent of the two-party preferred vote. That was a landslide. We're seeing the no case at levels above that. So if that's what the election is going, the referendum is going to produce, it will be very clear very quickly. So do you want to have a punt now? What time do you think you're going to be calling it? I, I've always said by 7.30, you know the result. You know whether you know the result or whether you'll have to wait for more figures. I think the polls are indicating that it will be very clear very quickly. The count will come in quicker at a, at a, a referendum. The only difference is we don't know we, don't, we can't do the polling place comparison information. We have to use the raw numbers more, which means you need to wait a bit longer because you have to wait to get some city votes. My view is that once we start to get some um, votes in, results in from the capital cities in each state, that's the point when you'll be able to call it and it will just take a while to get there. Okay, so that's your tip for everyone watching. Early on, it'll be from the country. That'll ve definitely um, skew no. And later on, you'll start to get the yes votes in. And Anthony, did you say that the postal votes would favour the no argument? Usually they're more conservative, aren't they? Postal votes favour the conservative side because you get a lot of people who live in the country, you get a lot of people who are um, um, religion, not mainstream religions, you get people who are elderly because they can't get out and vote. So there's a lot of that in the postal vote and it's always, you know, throughout Australian history, been more conservative than the on the day votes. Interesting. Oh. All right, Anthony, good luck on the night. Thank you. It's always a big night for you. Thanks. Okay. If, if that's, I think, all we've got time for. Um, it was fun to do this. Mm -hmm. As I say, Anthony is our secret weapon. You'll all be there glued to your screens. It'll be a big production, all your radios. Um, if you've got more questions, have a listen to our podcast. It's called The Voice Referendum Explained. The episodes are all short, just 15 minutes long, and you can find them on the ABC Listen app. Or you can watch them on ABC iView. Just search The Voice Referendum Explained. That's right. There we are. We'll be on your telly or in your podcast ears whenever you want us. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs>
an advisory committee. I, I strongly advocate a no vote because I've listened respectfully to all of the contributions. I've listened to the legal advice. Today we're going for a walk to take a look at both sides of this debate. Down this road is the case for the no campaign. On this street, we'll take a look at the yes case. Yes and no are fighting for our vote. Many are undecided. They're trying to figure out what's best, who was right and who should I believe? Welcome to Yes Street. The government and prominent Indigenous Australians are driving this campaign to enshrine an Indigenous voice in the Constitution. They've developed the law and the referendum question we'll all vote on. Now those on the Yes side say that the voice will help close the gap, that it was years in the making. They say it was designed by First Nations communities to help empower them. The result of lots of dialogue that culminated at the Uluru Convention in 2017. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. But exactly what the voice looks like, how it's built, what it does, how it operates, that will all be decided by politicians after the nation votes yes. Now, those on the yes side have been criticised by the no side for not providing enough detail. But let's take a look at how campaigners think the voice might work. They say it will be a committee of Indigenous peoples who give advice to the parliament on issues that affect their community. They believe it should have First Nations representatives from every state or territory, including representatives from regional and remote areas, be gender balanced and include you. And it will have no veto power over the parliament. I will ask the voice to consider four main priority areas, health, education, jobs and housing. But not everyone is convinced. This is no street. This is the position of opposition leader Peter Dutton, the Nationals Party, including Senator Jacinta Nampijumpa Price. No matter what the government, the advocates and the activists say about what The Voice will or won't do, the fact is they don't no. In this booklet from the Electoral Commission, official campaigners outline 10 reasons why you shouldn't vote for The Voice. Here's a few of them. They claim it's risky and could lead to delays in government and possible legal challenges. That it'll be divisive and give Indigenous Australians a political advantage. And it's permanent. There's no trial period and it's still not clear how some parts will operate. There are some Indigenous Australians who don't back The Voice. What are their reasons? We are saying no to the referendum and no to the voice. There are some who describe themselves as a progressive no vote. They want treaties and truth telling before an enshrined voice. Others don't want constitutional recognition at all. Others say Indigenous Australians should be represented by their MPs like all other citizens. There's also distrust of the government because of past policies and some just question whether this will bring about real change. Many are still undecided. Indigenous Australians only make up 4% of the population. It's the vote of the other 96% that will decide their future. 